In all the created realm, man is unique. He's a creature, yes, and he shares his creatureliness with all other creatures. He is not God. God is wholly other, unlike anything else he has made. But man alone is made in the likeness and the image of God. Already, the inevitable incarnation of God casts its shadow back over the account of creation. Man looks like God. Adam bears a striking similarity to Jesus. It is good to be man, to be human, because Jesus is man. Jesus is human. And it's good to be a man. Men and women are both good and yet markedly different. Part of their goodness is in their distinction from each other. Despite the popular cultural narrative that says men and women are essentially the same, interchangeable human beings in roles they can assign themselves, regardless of their different sexes, they simply aren't. Men and women are inherently different, outwardly and inwardly, in hardware and software. The essence of being a man is chiseled into your DNA, apparent at the chromosomal level of every one of the 37 trillion cells in your body. But just being a man, just having Y chromosomes and external genitalia, that doesn't make you masculine. That's why you're here, right? That's why we're all here together on this journey trying to make ourselves more masculine. But what does that mean? If you distill masculinity down to its purest 200 proof essence, it's sacrifice. And the opposite of masculinity then is selfishness. So masculinity is not a single trait. It's not identifiable by external characteristics. It's a lifestyle a discipline. Masculinity means harnessing the natural power a man possesses and using it for the good of others around him. The essence of masculinity is not rugged independence, it's sacrificial giving. That's a tall order. No one does it perfectly. No man's flesh is able to withstand the allure of selfishness, of softness, of malachia. You cannot free yourself from softness and selfishness, but you can be set free. In fact, you have. St. Paul says that you used to be soft, selfish, effeminate, inclined towards self-preservation and self-gratification until you were washed until you were baptized. Your baptism into the holy triune name of God was the beginning of your quest to be a good man, a masculine man, a selfless, sacrificial man. It was also the end of that journey. All your selfishness died in the watery grave of the baptismal font. In Christ then, you are holy and whole, a new man, a masculine man, a sacrificial giving man. It is Christ in baptism who has prepared you for this task of honing your masculinity for the good of others around you. The world needs masculine, Christ-like men. People around you are depending on you desperately needing you to step up and play the man. So, let's go. If you want to know what's good, you can go back to the beginning, to the twilight of the sixth day of creation. When the Creator looked at His creation, having placed the capstone of mankind atop the beautifully ordered world, and called it very good. Creation sets the pattern for what is good and shows the way this realm ought to function. The first two chapters of Genesis 
also give us a window into the last chapters of the Bible as well, as what the Creator made is what will be restored and perfected in the resurrection when Jesus returns. In Genesis 1, with the fast-paced, high-level view of God's work, the language changes in the middle of day six, where all God's other creative work had begun with, let there be. Now, as he creates mankind, he says, let us make. Then, what he makes is unique and set apart from what he had made previously. Now, he makes man in his own image, after his likeness. He commands them to be fruitful and multiply, and he gives man dominion over the rest of creation. These are the holy callings of humanity. Exercise dominion, the Lord commands. That is, take my place and do my work for my creation. Be lords. Procreation is as close as man gets to God's creative work. Whereas God created ex nihilo, that is, from nothing, man procreates from almost nothing, from two haploid cells, each genetically only half of the person who contributes it. To be sure, we should not shy away from this work, no matter how scary it is, no matter how risky it is, to your own little empire of self. In Genesis 2, Moses slows the tape and switches to a different camera angle, this time from below, from man's perspective, with the focus zoomed in to one very small part of creation. Whereas Genesis 1 focused on man and woman created together, now we see the gap between the creation of Adam and that of his wife, a gap in time as well as a difference in source material, Adam from dirt, woman from man. Between the creation of man and woman is the arresting declaration from God that something is not good. It is not good for man to be alone. And there is the essence of masculinity. It cannot be expressed alone. Alone, Adam has no one to serve, no one to love, no one to give himself to and for. Alone, he cannot sacrifice. He cannot be masculine even if he is fully man. From the complementarity, that's complement with an E, not the kinds of compliments your wife needs from you, but the kind of complementarity of man and woman coming back together to fulfill for each other what is lacking in each, comes the answer to this not good predicament. He is for her what she is not in herself, and she for him is what he is not. God gives Adam a helper. From this union, God solves the rest of Adam's aloneness too. He receives children, a tribe of brothers and friends, and a community. All of these are the arenas where Adam should have lived out his manly calling to sacrifice himself for the good of others. And likewise, these are the estates in which God calls you and enables you to be masculine, to sacrifice yourself for the good of all these others. Well, that didn't last long. The idyllic ending of Genesis 2 quickly devolves into the chaos of sin and rebellion of Genesis 3 where Genesis 2 ended with everything in its proper place, Genesis 3 is about everything out of place. And yet, even after Adam's rebellion, after his selfish treatment of his wife as a guinea pig to test the veracity of God's word, 
God promised that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. There was hope for the man and woman, rooted in their conjugal union, hope for a son who would one day undo their sin and restore all of creation to its proper functioning order. What was rightly ordered by God became quickly disordered by Adam. In Adam's sin, man has become unmasculine, effeminate. He is besieged by Malachia. He's gone from selfless to self-centered, fixated on his own good and using others as a means to his own good. Self-centered, focused on what Adam needs and what makes Adam happy, and self-preserving, willing to sacrifice even his own helper to save his hide. To be clear, effeminacy is not the same as femininity. Women are to be feminine. Men are to be masculine. Femininity is as desirable and praiseworthy for a woman as masculinity is for a man. Effeminacy is a sin for men or for women. It is selfish abdication of one's calling to serve others. Without his service to others to measure his masculinity then, a man has to settle for self-centered ways to evaluate himself. When he's no longer oriented towards seeing others, seeing service to them as his highest ideal, man must settle for ancillary ways to measure his stature as a man. But God won't abide with those contests. Instead of letting man save his own skin, God commands him to sacrifice a piece of his own skin, to remove a piece of his most intimate private part as the sign that it would not be man, Adam or Abraham, who brought about salvation but God alone. Sadly, this is not just Adam's predicament, it's ours too. None of us is immune from the selfish allure of offering sacrifices on the altar of the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I, instead of offering ourselves as sacrifices for the good of others and to the glory of the God who has called us to be holy. Adam's Selfish sickness infects us all. All of us men incline towards the easy, the comfortable, the self-centered, the self-preserving, self-serving nature of our broken flesh. There's no blue pill to fix this dysfunction, though. The problem is not outside us, in society, in our wives, in our families. The problem is with us. We are the source of our own effeminacy. That's a tough pill to swallow. But in swallowing it, in owning the dysfunction of our flesh, in repentance, there can be hope.